If you didn't know, the author, when leafing through on heels on the Middle East, might assume Ketsenia Svetlova must be an elderly writer looking back on decades of work. But while it is certainly clear that Ms. Svetlova has gone where few women or men have ventured, nowhere do we see reason to believe we're looking at anything but a work in progress. Journalist, former member of the Israeli parliament, teacher, I'm delighted to welcome you to the Media Line for your first English interview on your exciting newly released book, On the Heels on the Middle East. The geographic scope of your travels reads like an international thriller, as an Israeli and Russian stepping into the Middle East in Syria, Lebanon, the Gaza Strip, and Egypt. Were you ever afraid? Uh, in the beginning of the appraisal. Uh, and uh, eventually the places that I did go, I depicted in the book. Uh, I was, you know, working with my own paranoia. I was, you know, fearing for being followed. And uh, it made me feel very much uncomfortable because, you know, I am an Israeli. Uh, I'm not like the journalist who can travel from, uh, I don't know, New Jersey or from uh, Rome or from Moscow and uh, like, basically being themselves. You know, I have these two identities uh, and I cannot let go of any one of them. Bahrain has been in the news these past months. For you, it must bring up memories of being on an aircraft carrier off of its coast during the Second Gulf War in 2003. Tell us how that came about. I remember reporting to the Channel 2 from the bushes <laughs> of a diplomat hotel in the center of Manama, but I had to go like to the most secluded area where nobody could, nobody could hear me because I was thinking, if somebody will understand that I'm speaking Hebrew now for the Israeli media outlet, what will happen? Maybe the same that happened to Itai Engel in Kuwait. He was prior you know, to myself, he was in Kuwait, and uh, it was published by Shark al that, that there is an Israeli uh, who is now uh, broadcasting from the midst of uh, the Persian Gulf from Kuwait, and uh, he had to leave very quickly, you know, because he was fearing for... How has Bahrain changed since then? Well, uh, you know, I think that uh, the past 20 years, they slowly built this atmosphere of uh, acceptance of this idea of having a peaceful uh, relations with Israel. Uh, I uh, covered it uh, and I was astonished, you know, by the change that I felt that came soon after the war in the Gulf, you know. Uh, it, there was this feeling that this uh, weakening of the Arab Sunni world, uh, which began, of course, you know, with I think 9-11, you know, you can take it as a starting point and then into the war in the Gulf when Iraq is basically eliminated, you know, as a major Arab Sunni power. Uh, and then uh, into this string of events that end with, uh, you know, the Arab Spring or begin with the Arab Spring, depend on how you look at it. Uh, it brought the Arab regimes in the, in the, in the region here, especially the, those in the Gulf to understand that Israel is not Israel is not an enemy. Many of them were thinking that already before, because you remember the peace initiative uh, of uh, you know King Faisal uh, back in uh, 1981. You know, so he was proposing something very something very similar to the Arab peace initiative back then. But then it came to Arab peace initiative, and then it came to uh, basically reaffirming uh, the Arab peace initiative despite the, what is happening here with the Palestinians, uh, and then uh, uh, you know. The, of course, the big uh, headline is the Abraham Accords. But prior to that, you had 20 years of quiet relationship of trade, uh, of uh, cooperation in the security field. I know personally many Israelis who were traveling for years and years, you know, to the Emirates, also to Bahrain. Uh, but and, I, I have and beyond. And beyond in Saudi Arabia, of course, you know. So uh, as we hear today, that uh, you know the pr uh, Israeli Prime Minister can take a flight and hope to uh, Riyadh to meet the Crown Prince there. We need to understand what had happened to the Arab Sunni world during these two decades. You know, so you see the eruption of the forces uh, that, that is destructive to the Arab uh, regimes, most of all, you know, the like ISIS. But you also see the you know, democratization forces that are also, you know, destabilizing that. They need to reinvent themselves somehow, you know, so they need to reinforce uh, their uh, treaties with the United States from one side and also from powerful, with powerful regional allies like Israel. Readers will see some familiar, famous and infamous personalities in the pages of your book. As a journalist, you interviewed numerous Arab leaders from Yasser Arafat to Amr Musa, chairman of the Arab League. What were the defining moments meeting them? Well, you know, one of the defining moments, I think, for me, it was interviewing Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, the leader of Hamas. Um, first of all, it happened um, in the late February 2004, a few weeks before he was uh, actually liquidated by the IDF. 
The decision was made already by the time that I interviewed him. I got a call from Gaza, from one of the friends, journalists, and said, well, you know, today is the day that you can score it. If you come to Gaza right now, I mean, within the next two hours, and I'm in the midst of my driving test in <laughs> Jerusalem, uh, you know, it's my, uh, I think, you know, fifth attempt <laughs> to, to get the driving license. And I'm like, okay, I'm not doing the test, get, you know, bye, I'm, I'm, as I am, you know, in jeans and, uh, and sweater, I'm traveling to Gaza, uh, taking taxi and I'm uh, going to Gaza Strip. And you know, when you, as a journalist, you are focused on the questions that you want to ask. I was thinking like, oh my God, you know, I just met the pure evil, the pure evil. You know, that he also said it in the interview. We will fight you till the doomsday. We will continue making the terrorist, the he didn't call it, of course, terrorist, Amaliyat, okay, in, uh, in Arabic. We will, uh, you know, do, we will be, you know, fighting you. Uh, and everybody, we consider everybody as a soldier. It's the terrorist organization that it always was. And its intention is to chase the Jews from this land, part of the land or all of the land, but this is actually what, the, what they want to do. So you, I think you can learn a lot, you know, a lot from this kind of interaction with this. Uh. Is there one interviewee you would like to have back for five minutes to ask one more question? What would it be? Wow, I think that uh, I would ask Yasser Arafat, I would ask Yasser Arafat, do you see what is happening 16 years after you've gone? Your people are miserable. Your people are divided. You could have done of the, all of this differently. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you, you know, take this step towards the peace of the brave that you were talking about with its Hakrabin and then with the Ud Barak? Why didn't it happen? Okay, so look at the outcome. Look what the misery that you brought. You were the last female journalist to interview Hamas founder Sheikh Ahmed Yassin before he was assassinated by Israel in one of the early targeted killings. You asked him if the disengagement was a victory for Hamas. What did he say? Hamas absolutely took their, I mean, uh, uh, their responsibility for that, and they uh, they owned they owned uh, you know this uh, this achievement as if it was their own making. Uh, they were promoting this narrative of, you know, with our brave attacks against the Israelis, the soldiers, and they consider everybody a soldier, okay, even if it's 10-month baby. Uh, we uh, got them understand that they will not be living peacefully here in Gush Katif, you know, in Gaza Strip. So this is ours. The Palestinian autonomy didn't do such a thing. And I think this was a, you know, basically a big mistake on the part of the decision makers here in Israel. Instead of marketing this as a joint attempt of the Palestinian autonomy, led by Abu Mazen already at the time, uh, and uh, Israel of, uh, you know, some kind of attempt, you know, to make things right uh, and uh, achieve peace. Any frequent traveler knows things don't always go as planned. In 2005, you were entering Lebanon for the first time, but you almost didn't enter beyond passport control. What happened? Um, well, um, so uh, regarding Lebanon, um, I had a bigger plan than just going to Lebanon. I also wanted to go to Syria. I was able to, you know, enter Lebanon, but the problem was at the Syrian border, okay? And um, I was going there with a few friends, journalists that I've met, you know, during my war, uh, work during uh, coverage of the Rafik al-Hariri's assassination, and then the Ashura events uh, in uh, southern Lebanon. Uh, and uh, when I get to the border, they tell me, well, you can enter, but you will not be able to go back to Lebanon. Okay, uh, all of my stuff are in Lebanon and uh, I need to go to Lebanon eventually, okay, because my flight ticket is from there. And I'm saying to them, but why? And I said, because, you know, with your Russian passport, it's a kind of a problem. Uh, too many women want to cross the border and go here and there. And suddenly I understand that he implies something there. Yes, that uh, if you have a Russian passport, then probably you want to work in Lebanon, you know, this is we are talking about the Lebanon uh, um, uh, soldier, a Lebanese soldier, and uh, I'm, uh, you know, wanted. I want to tell him that listen, I'm not what you think. <laughs> you know, I'm not a, you know, Russian cold girl. I'm an Israeli journalist, and then I understand. No, it's better to shut up about this. Actually, you know, uh, in this very moment. So I didn't go to Syria at that time. I went to Syria one year later when I was uh, shooting a film uh, together with one of the Russian, actually Russian Jewish producers, uh, about the Islamic terrorism, and we ended up in Damascus eventually. Yes, but not that time. Uh, basically, going into Be going into Lebanon. Um, you know, um, it's, a, it's, it's a journalistic luck. I call it journalistic luck. I planned to go to Lebanon. 
uh, I had this uh, kind of confidence of a 27 year old. <laughs> well, you were <laughs> there when Rafik Hariri was killed. Yes. Well, you know, uh, I was sitting with, you know, in my uh, in the apartment of my father, drinking tea with him uh, two years before I was supposed to go to Lebanon, to Beirut. And then suddenly I understand that, you know, I hear the news something about Lebanon. I, you know, turned the volume a little bit and uh, I hear that the Rafik al-Hariri was just uh, murdered uh, in the midst of uh, Beirut uh, while driving, you know, with his uh, entourage. Uh, and, well, I, the first thing I thought that, well, you know, how lucky am I? Because I have a ticket to Beirut. <laughs> uh, you know, in 36 hours I'm supposed to be there. And you are not a journalist at all because as a journalist they would not let me in. That's the thing. I didn't have any accreditation. You know, I was writing for a commerçant at the time, the Russian commerçant. I was writing for Gazeta, one of the media, Russian media also, but I was not accredited in Lebanon. Uh, so it was kind of a uh, you know, risky adventure going there as a journalist with my uh, small Olympus uh, mini cam, <laughs> uh, my orange color, and uh, trying to make the best of it. You know, and the and the at the end, I arrived a few hours before the funeral of Rafik Al Hariri, and uh, I witnessed, you know, what you can call the Cedar Spring. Yes, the appraisal of the Lebanese who were so shocked, you know, by this political murder. Uh, I also saw the young, the, the Lebanese youngsters who were lighting the candles, exactly like the Israeli uh, youngsters used to do uh, with this Hakrabin after his assassination. Many Palestinians reside in Lebanon, but without the status of citizens. They live in refugee camps, one of the most notorious of which is Ain al Hilwa, in South Lebanon. It was there where you met Munir al-Mahda, a senior Fatah leader who founded the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, one of the most lethal groups. Describe the camp and the meeting. You know, I try to, when I try to think about this place, I, first of all, I think about misery, how much misery, you know, I saw there. Um, it was also the day, you know, the day it was, he was sticky, speaking, he was protected by this uh, special, uh, you know, glass uh, cube. Uh, but he still, he was there by, by, by himself. And he, of course, it was a time, you know, when he could, you know, the correlation between what happened in the 7th century with Hussein and between the struggle that Hezbollah is waging against Israel uh, and the Shia is waging, you know, against Israel, Iran and so on. He combined it all together and then suddenly 100,000 uh, throats are shouting death to Israel, al mautli Israel. I'm standing there, I just like... I want not to be there at this moment, you know, because this is, of course, you know, very interesting as a journalist. Were you afraid? You know, I was not afraid this, at this moment because, you know, I knew that I'm okay, you know, they do not, they do not recognize me as an Israeli, yes? But uh, it was very difficult. It was because the air was filled with hatred. And I also saw the lips of some of the Lebanese reporters moving. You know, when they, you know, we were standing a little bit aside, but you, when you see this crowds are shouting, you know, death to Israel, some of the Lebanese reporting are just with their lips, they are, you know, repeating these words. And uh, it says, again, you know, this is very hard to be next to people who hate you, not you personally, but your people, you know, your, 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 your nation, your state. Uh, and what does it mean? Because I'm living here. I'm not going anywhere. Not me, not my kids, not my family. Ketsenia. Two Israeli journalists are invited to hear Gaddafi's plan for peace between Israel and the Palestinians. It's May 2005. You're one of them. You managed to see an ancient Jewish cemetery there. Were you able to photograph it? Um, well, uh, I was asked uh, specifically by the Libyan Jewish community if I will end in, uh, you know, myself, uh, if I'll find myself eventually in Libya. Uh, I met all of the Jewish uh, groups, by the way, you know, a long time ago, before it became like fashionable. I thought that it's very interesting, you know, to hear their stories and basically to underline that there is Jewish presence everywhere here in the Middle East. When people are telling us, you know, the Jews, the Israelis, you do not belong here. Look, look around you. Look at the synagogues, look at the Jewish cemeteries, look at the graves of the prophets that are everywhere in Iraq and, you know, beyond. So, of course, Jews are part of this region. They were always part of this, this region. And uh, when I was meeting the group uh, from Libya, the, um, the, uh, basically the diaspora meeting that they had once, and I told them, listen, I don't know, but there is, might be a chance might be a chance that I will go to Libya. And they said, if you do, please go to the cemetery in the city of Zlitan. It's next to the city of Zlitan. And uh, it's, it's abandoned now. We don't know what happened to it and if it even exists. So uh, I was a guest officially of the Gaddafi's led 
uh, think tank that is called the, it was called, it doesn't exist anymore, of course, uh, just like Kadaf himself, uh, the Institute for the Research of the White Book, in order to uh, photograph the very famous Sufi shrine uh, of uh, Al Ahmar, you know, that is uh, uh, there. Uh, and when we were just on the way out, I said, listen, let's make a little detour because there is a Jewish cemetery and I need to photograph it for some friend in Italy, a, Jew, a Libyan Jew. And uh, they really didn't want to go there. Eventually, we found this place. There was only one guy, an old guy, a Libyan uh, peasant, you know, that we, you know, met. And he said, yes, 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 I remember. There were a lot of Jews here once. He was maybe 80 years old, so he remembered. Uh, and this uh, Jewish cemetery, it was shattered. Uh, it was all crushed. It was, you know, it was a very sad thing to see because uh, 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 unlike, for example, in Syria, unlike some other places like in Tunisia and Morocco, uh, in Libya, Gaddafi basically gave green light to take everything that belonged to Jews, including the tomb graves, you know, the, including the stones on the graves. Uh, and uh, the, you know, local people used it, used it. So you saw the, you know, like in, intentional, you know, it was effort of the human being to crush, you know, the graves, to take some parts of the stone at home. And there was only one <laughs> grave that was intact uh, by the name of Kahlon. So I took it when I took a photo of it and I brought it to Moshe Kahlon uh, some month after that. And he recognized it as a tomb of one of his relatives. Yes. It's 2006. So, and you interview Hismail Hania, the leader of Gaza, one of the last times that you actually went in. Why did Hania speak with you? I found myself covering the Palestinian elections, uh, the so much discussed uh, elections uh, that took place by January 25 uh, of 2006. And, you know, not myself, I also not Ismail Hania. Nobody expected that this would be the result, you know. Uh, the clear leader, you know, that in this race was uh, Fatah, of course. And um, some of the people that I interviewed, there was some kind of like red light because they told me, listen, we hate the Fatah because they're corrupt, because they fill their, you know, pockets with our money. And you understand that this is the extreme poverty. This is the corruption, 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 corruption. And you can look at all over the Middle East. And Israel is not an uh, exclusion of that. Uh, how dangerous corruption is and what kind of you know, consequences it might have uh, for various countries and various uh, political movements. The Yarmouk refugee camp was recently back in the news. Over one year ago, the remains of Zachary Baumel, an Israeli soldier missing in action in the 1982 Lebanon war, was apparently found in that camp and returned to Israel. What do you believe is the backstory? Pre-2013, 2014, 15, in fighting uh, between the uh, government forces and between the terrorist organizations uh, that found shelter in uh, in this refugee camp. And, uh, you know, it was leveled. I think, uh, uh, you know, with this uh, soldier is that the, you know, Russian uh, 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 security forces knew all along where he is. And they decided to, you know, let the information out when it was comfortable for both, you know, Moscow and for Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister, shortly before the elections. Historic news of the American broker deals between the UAE, Bahrain and Israel has filled media since August. Just how far do you see the momentum carrying change in the region? Uh, first of all, uh, I think um, these deals, uh, they are a result of not only changing policies, but of changing realities here in the Middle East. Um, the, um, strife of uh, Iran to hegemony, the weakening uh, of the Arab system in general. I'm talking about, for example, Arab League, Arab institutions, Arab states that uh, some of them became failed states. Some of them do not exist anymore. Uh, you, there is a name only, but there is no state there. Uh, I think all of that brought to the current situation in which uh, you have, first of all, the size uh, and the importance of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict diminished, diminished to, you know, in comparison to what it used to be for the last 50 years. OK, so it was blown out of proportion. And today, I think it's undermined. Uh, so we are still not there. It will still follow us and we will still have to somehow resolve this, resolve this. Uh, but I think it's a great thing for the region and I think it's a great thing for Israel uh, because, yes, indeed, we have a common enemy, even two. You know, I would say the one enemy is Iran 
and another one is of course the Muslim Brotherhood uh, axis. Okay, uh, both of them are threatening our security. Both of them are threatening stability here in the Middle East, and this is. These things need to say to be very clear. Let's step back to Tunisia, where the Arab Spring kicked off in 2011. By 2013, you do a democracy check. Uh, first of all, you know, Tunisia, I think when we are looking at this um, map of the Arab Spring and what happened where, uh, why did Arab Spring erupt in Tunisia, first of all, yes? It's a question that is not being asked enough, I think, yes? Uh, everybody forgot about Tunisia very quickly because it was Egypt, because it was Syria and the heart of the Middle East. Uh, but Tunisia was always different. It had the middle class that was absent, for example, in Egypt and also in Syria. Uh, in Syria, you know, there were, you know, uh, uh, some traces of the middle class, you know, the merchants and so on, but not really. Uh, most of the people were very, very poor. They had this uh, independent institutions, such the trade unions, you know, uh, uh, women unions and so on. It was all not existent in other places in their world. And therefore, they were also, they had also much more, uh, uh, rights for women than any country here in the region and they become successful you know this was uh, quite a smooth transition you know from a uh, Zain al Abidin rule uh, to the uh, democratic rule that they have right now there's a shift now in Tunisia there is a shift now and we will be looking at it very closely but until this day they were able to you know uh, uh, get over where there is no possibility to get out uh, and to change their lives they could live years ago. They could leave to Israel. Many of them had been to Israel. They could leave to France, to United States, anywhere. What is they the size of the population now? Uh, it's, uh, I think it's 1,400 uh, people, more or less. Some families are leaving, some families are coming back, which is very interesting. People that are uh, making aliyah to Israel and then deciding to come back. Also to Morocco, you know, there is this phenomenon of people that you know, they feel more comfortable. They feel, despite all of the dangers, people, despite... People that are immigrating. Immigrating, and then they are coming back, uh, no matter what, because, uh, you know, I understand it as an immigrant myself. I understand that even when you are living a long time, you know, in your new uh, homeland and so on, and it's your historical homeland, and there is this religious meaning, sometimes you're just, how do you feel about that? It says, you know, I've been to Israel. I don't like the National Security Institute. How is Egypt different today? Yes, there is sexual violence in Egypt that is happening and it's, you know, affects 100 of Egyptian women. Uh, how come it will not affect, you know, the foreign journalist women who are there? It's still not a reason not to go there, but you have to know how to handle yourself, how to protect yourself, how to escape from dangerous places when you feel for a second that you are being in danger. I left. I left. I didn't stay. I prefer to go into some building and to observe you know, from, uh, you know, afar a little bit, the situation, and not to be in the midst of the crowd, because I do not know what, you know, would be happening if I would stay there. On Heels on the Middle East, it's a must read, it's a real read. And Ketsenia Svetlova, it's been an, a pleasure to have you this long time to really delve into your book so that others can understand the Middle East a lot better. Thank you so very much. It was a pleasure to talk to you and uh, to talk to a colleague and uh, to somebody who is in love in the Middle East just like I am. Thank you.